Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics of Now from Home, our attempt here at the Keenan Institute for Ethics to continue conversations of resonance and consequence, even in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Um, this is, as you know, a special off cycle. Um, what do you call it, episode, webisode, webinar, um, conversation that we thought was really necessary, that even in a uh, um, strange and disorienting time, there are some things that hit harder and with more intensity than others. And this week has been hard and it needs the work that we can do as a community to talk through it, to frame it, to work to understand it and to, um, think creatively and, and with breath about what kind of steps we can take. I'm going to be joined in that project by my colleague, Sandy Darity, who is the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of, um, of Public Policy, African and African American Studies and Economics here at Duke University. And he's the director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook um, Center on Social Equity at Duke. He previously directed the Institute for African American Research at UNC, as well as UNC's Moore Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program, which was just one of my favorite um, programs. If I were to talk about the sort of breadth of Sandy's research, I would be here forever. He researches many, many things. Among them, and I think salient to this conversation, he researches um, inequality by race, class, and ethnicity, stratification economics, schooling and the racial achievement gap, as well as other things as, such as the Atlantic slave trade and the Industrial Revolution, um, the history of economics and the social psychological effects of exposure to unemployment. Sandy is the author and co-author of many books, most recently with A. Kirsten Mullen, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Before I turn to conversation with Sandy, I want to explain to you guys a little bit how this is going to work. We're going to talk for a little bit less time than usual in order to give you guys more space to ask questions. The chat function has been disabled, so please submit your questions via the Q&A function, which you should be able to find down there at the bottom of your screen at the 1230 hour we will um, turn. We will turn to those questions and get the conversation going that way. You'll just see me and Sandy in this conversation, but there's actually a host of folks from the Keenan Institute for Ethics who are available should there be any technical difficulties or what have you. And when this is all over, you will receive a link to a recording of this conversation. So you can revisit it and continue to think through it for some time to come. And with that, I will turn to you, Sandy, and start first by thanking you very much for being here, for giving us your time and your wisdom on short notice. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, especially to be here with you, Adrian. Uh, you're, you're Absolutely one of my favorite historians. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You are unquestionably my favorite economist. So we are, um, and someday I actually Well that, I that may be that might not be as hard a mountain to climb. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a million ways that we could come into this. There are a million things that we could talk about. Um, it has been, as I say, a heck of a week. I'm going to actually ask you to frame it. So what what should we talk about or what should we be talking about right now as we approach this question of racism, police brutality and popular protests? I think that the kinds of inequalities that are linked to America's racial history and its racial present uh, were exposed dramatically by the COVID-19 crisis. And I think that the, uh, the murder of George Floyd, uh, which uh, was, extreme, was, was extraordinarily visible to everyone across the country, uh, was an, an instance that brought to light another dimension of inequality, which is uh, anti-Black police violence. 
And that also has a very, very long history. Uh, but I think it's only recently that we've gotten significant amounts of video evidence about the police's behavior, about their brutality. And I think that that's galvanized people into recognizing that this is an issue that has been of deep concern to the black community for, for years on end, but, uh, but, but folks are finally recognizing that it is a, uh, a serious issue and it's an issue associated with the devaluation of black life. This is a question that people have asked me and that I'm still thinking through, but we have video evidence now, but we've had video evidence before, right? Like for me, in some ways, this sort of defining moment of like my, my own sense of this crystallizing came with the Rodney King video or, right. or you know, footage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that was almost 30 years ago now. So what is it about this time that makes it land more fully than it seems to have landed? Or is that not the case? Is this the next manifestation of sort of outbreak or like people screaming in pain that we see over and over again? That's a great question. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had video evidence in the sense of photographic evidence. Uh, for years on end, particularly of lynchings, uh, mass mob lynchings. Uh, we have not had photographic evidence for the most part of lynchings that have been conducted by law enforcement. Uh, and in 1992, you're quite right, there was video evidence that surfaced of the beating of Rodney King uh, that had a significant impact ultimately on uh, the response that occurred in Los Angeles when the, uh, when the policemen who had conducted the beating were actually exonerated uh, in, in a court trial. And so, uh, so there was a galvanization that occurred there, but it was not, it was not nationwide, it was not international. And so I'm not sure of what explains the difference in this moment, except perhaps the effectiveness of a world in which people are devoting a substantial amount of time to social media, where the video was circulated widely, uh, creates a greater degree of, of knowledge and attention to it than, than existed existed before. So it, it may be the dynamics of the world of social media that's making a, a particular difference in this moment. Um, and and the, the video is so graphic. I mean, it's, uh, I think people are going to try uh, in, in defense of these, of these police to, to make some kind of claim that uh, it wasn't an act of murder, but the, the video is so graphic in demonstrating that this man is killed because a knee is held continuously on his neck uh, that uh, it, it's, it's sort of incontrovertible. And I, and I think that, uh, that the reaction that has occurred is, uh, is one that is, is, is of corresponding importance given the long record of police atrocities. This, this moment is one in which people are responding en masse. And you said of a few minutes ago that the moment that we're living in has laid bare that the the COVID crisis and in some ways the response to it have made hyper visible inequ inequities and inequalities that are long standing. Can you talk a little bit about what those what some of those are and how we see them now? So um, I think that the uh, the COVID nineteen crisis has made glaringly plain uh, the types of disparities that exist with respect to health outcomes in the United States. And so uh, the mortality rates for uh, Black Americans from COVID-19 are 2.2 uh, times as high as they are for uh, Latinos and for, uh, and for Asian Americans, and 2.4 times as high as they are for uh, white Americans. I think the only other 
a major social group in the United States that has comparable levels of mortality from the disease, or perhaps even higher, uh, are, are in indigenous people in the United States, Native American communities. Uh, but uh, those types of disparities are linked to three different considerations that I think are uh, un unfortunately interwoven. Uh, the first is uh, the greater susceptibility to mortality once infected is in part attributable to what people refer to colloquially as pre-existing conditions. Uh, other types of adverse health conditions that folks are carrying around with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Here I would include hypertension, asthma, diabetes, and the like uh, as, as pre-existing conditions that are disproportionately held by Black Americans. And so once you become infected, if you are a Black American, given the disproportionate presence of those pre-existing conditions, you probably have a greater likelihood of, of not surviving the disease. Uh, the second thing is that there's a higher level of infection or a higher infection rate in the Black community, which is attributable in large measure, I think, to the types of occupations that Black Americans hold. Uh, so Black Americans are disproportionately located in the types of jobs where you're going to have an increased risk of being exposed to the disease, particularly in the arena of hospital services, uh, transportation services, and the like. And uh, under those consequences, under those circumstances, uh, you're going to have a, uh, uh, a greater uh, predisposition just to be exposed to the disease, which then leaves you more vulnerable to mortality from it. Uh, but the third thing I'd like to highlight is, uh, and, and this may be a consequence of my impulses as an economist, the third thing I'd like to highlight is what, uh, what I view as a more fundamental pre-existing condition. Uh, my co-author on From Here to Equality, uh, Kirsten Mullen, likes to refer to this as a comorbidity. Uh, but this fundamental pre-existing condition is the enormous gap in wealth between blacks and whites, which structures an array of economic and health insecurities uh, in the black community in, in a dramatic and powerful and, and devastating way. Does it also, I mean, so I've been saying a lot that what you see is the different way, like the, that the responses both to protest and to the need to shut down, to distance, to shelter, to well, shelter in place, stay at home, that what you see is a difference in how people are valued right that it makes that it makes painfully clear how how little um african americans seem worth to the broader american public except in their labor and i'm wondering if that's tied up in this wealth gap that you're talking so there's about. there's an uh an interesting distinction that uh that uh the economist Rhonda sharp makes between essential jobs and essential workers. And she argues that Black Americans are disproportionately located in jobs that are viewed as essential, but they themselves are viewed as dispensable. And so uh, that, that connects back to the, the, uh, to, the, to the point that I tried to make at the very beginning of our conversation about the devaluation of Black lives. Uh, so Black lives are not worth as much so why not have black people in the jobs where they're at greater risk of being exposed to uh, a deadly infectious disease? So, um, you know, this, this is something that we really have to confront is the way in which uh, black lives are, are devalued. Uh, in From Here to Equality, we offer an estimate that historically and in the present moment, uh, black lives typically have never been valued at more than 30% of white lives. Uh, and we, we offer some numerical estimates of, of how you can go about coming up with that calculation, uh, but it's a very grim calculation. 
So um, do you remember was the sort of mid 90s or so when Lonnie Guineer sort of was, I think she might even have published a book about it, but she talked about African-Americans as the miners canary, the mm -hmm. things that are, that one is able to practice upon or, or do to African-Americans, make certain practices or attitudes imaginable and that eventually they will be practiced upon others beyond my back. So is, I mean, I, I bring that up because I wonder if there isn't a way too to say consistently African-American lives are valued less, but the moment that you're in territory where some lives are worth, worth less than others, you're in territory where all lives are worth less than they might be. Is that sort of too abstract an argument to make? Or? No, no, it's, it's, it's not too abstract. Uh, I, I, I just want to be careful about equating the scope of the devaluation of Black lives with the other forms of devaluation that may take place. Um, I, you know, you, you certainly can make the argument that the, uh, the most recent uprising in response to uh, to the people as black people, but uh, this is in the context of protest activity. Uh, the police are, are brutal to black folks, regardless of the right. circumstances. And so, uh, so, so, so you're right that what has happened or what has been inflicted on black people clearly can function as a signal about what the possibilities are for others. Uh, but, uh, but the fact that, uh, that blacks are the canary in the mine means that blacks are the ones who face the most immediate danger and, the, uh, and, and potentially the most severe danger. Um, I have two questions that go in completely opposite directions. I want to come back to talking about um, what we do about the sort of the wealth gap, right? About that particular piece of comorbidity. Before we get there, I actually want to ask you a different question, which is kind of like how you read this moment. What does the state's response to protest tell you about this state right now? Like what generalizations are you willing to make about like where our federal government is or are you willing to make any, right? Do we learn something from how they're behaving, I guess? Is so so are, you, are, you, are you talking about the Trump regime? I am talking about the Trump regime <laughs> and, okay. and maybe not, right? Am I talking about the Trump regime? Am I talking like, I mean, what is the reach? Who are we talking about when we talk about that? That's part of the question. But and and maybe are there things that sort of like COVID itself that Trump makes clear, but that we can that cannot be excised, right? Simply by sort of dealing with his vision of what power looks like. So um, I have an inclination to say things that. Uh, frequently get me into trouble. Uh, <laughs> Should I stop you from that or encourage you? <laughs> I, I'm going to plunge ahead. Uh, <laughs> you know, on on um, on the day of Trump's election, you know, I I wrote uh, I, well shortly after I wrote a piece for the Atlantic about uh, the implications of Trump's election for for the racial wealth gap. And I made a comment in my written notes that were then transcribed and placed into the journal. I made a comment that they, they, they excised, they did not keep it in. And I talked about uh, the real danger with the Trump administration is that he's a proto-fascist. And today I would take the adjective proto off of it. And so that's, that's what, uh, to me, is is the most uh, the most frightening dimension of what's going on right now is the uh, the individual sitting in the office of the presidency uh, has a view that he should maintain absolute authority and probably try to maintain it as long as he possibly can. 
even beyond his term of office. Uh, and so uh, I would also say that the American police forces, uh, you know, have disproportionately functioned as, uh, as an ally in a white supremacist mission that's associated with, uh, with those, those, uh, those fascistic tendencies. So uh, I know that's strong language on my part, but I think it's, it's really, really quite accurate. And, and the irony in this is that if any uh, institution is functioning as a bulwark, and I, I pray that they continue to do so, it's actually the American military, which has, uh, whose leadership have, for the most part, uh, deeply internalize the notion of their constitutional position and their constitutional status. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's why some of the, uh, the, the, the former military leaders and current military leaders are the folks who are pushing back on this notion that you should mobilize the U.S. Army for the purposes of repressing the protesters. Um, I am not going to ask follow-up questions. I'm going to let the folks in Q&A ask follow-up questions because in the last few minutes that we have left for our conversation, I want to come back to this, what do we do question. When someone asks you, um, given where we are right now, given the problems, given the structures, given the everything, what are concrete steps that are available to us to build a better, like however you want to think about your community, sort of local America, you know, world. Uh, do you want me to speak to that now or? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I'm one of those people who's convinced that the kinds of conditions that we observe today, like the racial wealth gap, where black Americans constitute 13% of the nation's population, but only have 2.6% of the nation's wealth. Uh, and this is a condition that translates into an $800,000 differential in net worth between the average black and the average white household. Uh, and that I'm convinced that those conditions are a consequence of social policy in the United States and that the way in which we eliminate that type of disparity is by social policy also. So, uh, so I'm definitely not an individual who thinks that the way in which you combat the errors or the wrongs of governmental practice is by having less government or no government, but it's by changing what government does. And so uh, if, if if, if I were to recount the social policies or the history of the conditions that shape the current racial wealth gap, I would start with the failure to provide the formerly enslaved in the United States with the 40 acre land grants that they were promised. And at the same time that that was taking place, that that act of denial was taking place, you had the allotment of 160 acre land grants going to a substantial number of white Americans in the western part of the United States. This, this is land that was taken from Native Americans, uh, but these 160 acre allotments were being given to white Americans in the western part of the United States under the terms of the Homestead Acts. And so I would argue that if, if we're thinking about where the current racial wealth gap begins, that's the starting point, the immediate aftermath of the Civil War and the way in which American social policy was conducted on a racialized basis to provide free equity to many white Americans and to deny the formerly enslaved any type of restitution for their years of forced service and stolen time. So uh, we can then extend that into thinking about the failure of the government to react to white massacres that took place from the end of the Civil War up until the 1940s, where black lives were taken, where black property was destroyed or appropriated and seized by whites. We can also carry through into the 20th century with the social policies that were associated with home ownership and the existence of um, restrictive covenants, followed by redlining, uh, 
all associated with predatory lending in the housing market, as well as the, uh, the racialized application of the GI Bill in such a way that the decentralized administration of the bill meant that it was white veterans who got the kinds of funds to support home buying and black veterans generally did not. I think Ira Katz Nelson estimated or, or, or provided a statistic in the state of Mississippi that there were only two black returning veterans from World War II that got any support from the GI Bill. Uh, and and that's in his book, question. When Affirmative Action Was White, which I think uh, is a yeah. perfect name to yeah. let you understand what was happening. We also had a circumstance where at the introduction of the kind of social welfare programs that we think of today as forming the safety net, that those programs were designed intentionally in the 1930s to only provide services to whites. And so, uh, I mean, that's the way they got the Southern Democrats to support the New Deal. Um, and so, uh, so there's a host of ways in which white Americans have received uh, what they frequently refer to as handouts, but don't acknowledge those handouts. And those handouts are the foundation for the kinds of immense racial wealth disparities we observe today. Uh, and so, uh, so that's why I would say that the solution or the policy solution that needs to be, needs to be embraced is a program of reparations for black American descendants of US slavery a reparations program that would erase the racial wealth gap altogether. Okay. Um, I will turn to Q&A. It's, as you were talking, it occurred to me that this week marks the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, yeah. right? Um, and how did Durham in some ways become the capital of the black middle class and was with the destruction of black Wall Street, Street which was a deliberate act. So it's not, as you say, not simply a failure of the federal government to provide, but a seizing of the wealth that did exist through anti-Black collective violence. And that is a context that I would argue is important to keep in mind when we look at people on the streets right now and say, heaven forfend, what on earth could possibly produce this? And we're outraged at the destruction of property that we see before us, right? That there have been far more egregious, far more outrageous, and far more deadly um, examples of, of people in the street. Yeah, my colleague Keisha Bentley Taylor uh, led a group of us in preparing a paper that explored the irony of the Kerner Commission report, that the Kerner Commission report was issued in response to urban uprisings in the mid 1960s, virtually all of which were prompted by police brutality, once again, in, in predominantly black communities. Uh, but there was a Kerner Commission report about black urban uprisings, but there never has been a national report about the immense wave of, of white terror campaigns and white massacres that took place between, as I said, the end of the Civil War and into the 1940s, well into the 1940s. So, uh, so yeah, we, we actually called the paper the Missing Kerner Commission Report. Um, I will go to Q&A. You don't have to respond to this. Sometime we need to have a conversation about the vision of reparations that is visible in the HBO TV show, The Watchmen, which grows out of the um, you know, the sort of founding moment of the Tulsa race riot, because I think given your interest in speculative fiction and kind of how we think through alternate worlds, you would find it very fascinating. Okay, yes. turning to the questions. Is there a concerted effort to fully define reparations for African descendants of slavery? What proposals fully acknowledge the culpability of the U.S. federal government? Well, uh, that's kind of a softball for me because the book that we did, <laughs> From Here to Equality, uh, precisely identifies the federal government as the culpable party. And in the final chapter, we outline uh, a detailed proposal for the actual execution of a reparations program. Um, and, uh, you know, we address a, a, a standard array of questions. How would you identify who would be eligible to receive uh, reparations? How would you distribute the reparations fund? How much would it need to be? 
and um, and and what type of administrative agency would you have to have in place to to effectively execute the program? So um, yeah, the U.S. government is the culpable party from from my standpoint, and on our book provides uh, an extended discussion of of why we identify the U.S. government as the culpable party. It, it does mean, though, that this is something that that may be uh, may be of particular significance from the perspective of historians. It does mean that we center the beginning point for the case for reparations in 1776 with the formation of the United States government rather than 1619, which is the presumed date that the first enslaved uh, black folks were brought to the United States. Uh, so given that uh, the United States government didn't exist until 1776, we start the analysis of the Bill of Particulars in that year. Right, because otherwise we'd be bringing in a history of, uh, we'd, we'd need a historian of the British North Atlantic or a British like sort of colonial, that, that and, and I Spain mean. Spain and France, right. and, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. that on some level it's a reminder that we also, we pursue our sort of our policy projects often through national frames when we are talking about questions that affect U.S. citizenship on the ground as they lived, but they exist within larger networks and histories that um, that speak to and sort of deep embedded but and our, intertwined. Our precedents for effective reparations programs, though, have been primarily programs that have been generated by targeting national governments as the right. culpable entities, yeah. Right. Um, would you see any value in America having a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like the one in South Africa? Does it have to happen at a national level or could institutions like Duke have their own commissions to reveal and reflect on their own histories? So uh, first of all, I, I'm not sure that the term, the accurate term, I don't think it was accurate in the South African context is reconciliation. Okay, because um, reconciliation means a restoration of previous right. harmonious conditions. And I don't think we've ever had those harmonious conditions. So if you want to call it a truth commission, fine. If you want to call it a truth and conciliation commission, fine. But I, I have no idea how the term reconciliation came into play in this context. Um, I don't think that the South African example is a particularly salutary precedent for what we might do in the United States. So if we were to establish something that's of, of parallel fashion, it would have to have uh, a different agenda. Uh, it would have to be designed explicitly for the purposes of establishing a comprehensive reparations program at the national level. So uh, you know, whether or not you call it the, the same thing is another matter, but it, it should not be the same thing. Um, the, the other point I'd, I'd like to make is with respect to uh, local entities, uh, local organizations, universities, colleges that have complicity with the United States' history of slavery and also with Jim Crow, uh, because, uh, you know, we had 100 years, nearly 100 years of legal segregation in the United States accompanied by these white terror campaigns, uh, that uh, I, I'm fine with the idea of them addressing their own racist practices and trying to reverse them. I, I think colleges and universities, you know, make a lot of symb symbolic noises, but uh, a really fundamental change that could occur at predominantly white institutions is to truly transform the demography of their faculties. And this is something that they've been more resistant to doing than changing the demography of their student bodies. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, there's some very clear and direct things that individual institutions can do. This would constitute suspending a pattern of racist practices, but it would not constitute restitution for the historic impact of those racist practices. So I'm reluctant for people to refer to these types of things as, as reparation. Maybe they're acts of atonement. Uh, maybe they're acts of correction, but they're certainly not, uh, uh, they're certainly not acts of restitution. 
So the next question asks, I've heard some talk this week about defunding the police. Could you speak to what the argument is exactly and the implications of it? Do you see a police abolition movement gaining traction? And then this is a related, but I think um, equally as large question, is it worth examining the role of unions and standing in the way of police reform? Oh, you mean police unions? Yes, I think it means police unions. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that is something that's worth, worth examining. Uh, let me slide into this from a slightly different angle. I am convinced that most of the efforts to try to address uh, police malfeasance have focused on trying to change the mindset of the police themselves. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of folks who are, are psychologists who have designed these types of programs that are supposed to help, uh, help the police change their point of view. Uh, I'm not convinced that that's particularly effective. And so once again, if I put my economist hat on, I'm gonna ask what are the incentives that the police have? And I would argue that you probably can have more of an impact on their behavior by uh, altering their incentives in such a way that there's a very, very high penalty associated with their malpractice and their brutality. Uh, so for example, if, you, uh, if, 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 uh, if somebody successfully sues uh, a police a policeman who has uh, has has grievously injured or killed one of their family members, then the payment for that suit should come out of the pension funds of the police, not out of municipal budgets. Uh, in addition, uh, you know we can we can address the question of qualified immunity that the uh, Supreme Court has thus far ascribed to the police. That's something that could be reversed. Uh, and of course, the, the power of police unions is, is a critical issue as well. I, I'm not altogether convinced that we should abolish police forces altogether, but I could be convinced on that. Most of the abolition work that I've been familiar with has been focused on uh, abolition of, 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 of the prison system as um. a part of functions. You know. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I'm quite willing to countenance uh, arguments about abolition of police forces, uh, but uh, I think that there, there is always some residue of true criminal activity that may need to be handled. Uh, and so abolition is one issue. Scaling back the police force in terms of numbers might be something that would be quite desirable to do. Uh, and definitely demilitarization of the police is vital. There is absolutely no good reason why police forces throughout the United States have access to the same type of military equipment that the US Army might be using. Let's see, what have we next? To move from the national recognition of such an intense issue, how do we narrow down our efforts and use the spotlight created by the protest? There doesn't seem to be a leader, although it seems that we are now in a movement. I love that phrasing, by the way. I think that also, like we can talk about sort of the idea of leadership and movements that, you know, Ella Baker would say strong people don't need strong leaders, right? That a movement doesn't need someone at the very fore of it. How do we look, um, who do we look to so that we can narrow down the reforms we need and avoid protesting at the risk of endangering our communities to no avail. At a memo, minimum, what sources are credible to turn to? Well, I'm not sure that I really can offer really uh, wise advice here, <laughs> but um, I'd, let me distinguish between what I think needs to be done to pursue a reparations program versus what may need to be, uh, be done to address police brutality. Uh, because it's not, it's not clear to me that the kind of wealth remedying strategies that are associated with the reparations program would necessarily also change how the American police forces are acting. So 
Uh, so those require two different kinds of agendas. With respect to reparations, uh, you know, uh, Kirsten Mullen and I have argued that what is, is, is the best thing that local organizations can do, individuals can do, uh, is to form a national consortium that petitions Congress for a comprehensive reparations program for black American descendants of US slavery. And uh, we are fortunate in the, in the context of Durham that we have a mayor who has uh, asked the city council to endorse precisely such a plan. The formation of a co consortium that would potentially be led by Durham uh, for the purposes of bringing together uh, national advocates of reparations for black Americans to lobby Congress for that type of social program. Uh, with respect to the police, I, I think there's, uh, there's the possibility of operating on all three levels of the political process. So uh, because, because our police forces are localized to some degree, like our school systems, uh, there's, there's political action that we could take at the municipal level. There's also political action that could be taken at the state level. And of course, there's uh, political action that could be taken at the, at the federal level. And I think that all of those routes have to be, have to be pursued. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any sound advice I have about how you organize those efforts. But I think any individual who is right-minded about these issues can try to form a, a team or a coalition to pursue the kinds of changes that are needed. And there may be some social organizations or political organizations that already exist that you might operate through to try to, uh, to, to, to galvanize these kinds of changes. Uh, but with respect to reparations, I'm absolutely convinced that we need to have a new national consortium that integrates colleges and universities, individuals, uh, private corporations, uh, state government, municipal government, that puts the pressure on the federal government to actually enact a reparations program. Right. And I'll just say, I'm so I'm sitting here like thinking about this question of leadership, and I'm going to make a general statement that I'm sure all of my other colleagues who work on civil rights history are going to ask me to nuance and temper. But I think that we overstate the, the significance and the role of individual leaders in the civil rights movement, right? Thinking back to that history, that we have our inspirational lights, we have people that we shorthand for certain groups and organizations. We have people who were particularly um, um, lyrical. The most inspiring legacies of the civil rights movement comes through groups like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating um, Committee or other groups that thought about leadership as something that was developed among a group that the questions and the goals were produced in like not just conversation but sort of like through the work and in relation to the work so i think it's less a question of who do we look for to tell us what to do but how do we work together to come to certain points um, that we know we need to work in concert yeah. Um, it's harder to kind of pin that down. It's harder to cover in the media, which is, I was going to say, is one of the ways that we ended up with the shorthand in the first place. But yeah. I, I think people have this feeling that individual leaders, charismatic leaders, are critical actors because of the impression that they have that when we lost certain individuals like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, that it, it, it truly diffused the, uh, the movements that they, that they were at the forefront of. Uh, but I, I think that that reinforces the point that you're making, that if we had a, a deeper wellspring of individuals who could come together as collective leaders or individually, uh, 
we would not put movement activities into jeopardy uh, to the to the same degree when we lost any particular individual, uh, no matter how gifted or or, or right. charismatic that individual might be. So. Uh, so yeah, there is an argument that there's an advantage to not actually having some single individual who is the uh, the major face of a movement, uh, and it's 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 probably better uh, if you have uh, a more diffused uh, cadre of leadership uh, than than something that's embodied in a single person. Right, and diffuse doesn't mean disorganized, right? No. It's a balance no. that people have to figure out. Um, so someone wanted to come back and put a sort of like fine point on your earlier argument to clarify. Are you saying that if penalties for police brutality are paid out from pension funds, that police will be more apt to police themselves? That's, that's the assumption. Right. The assumption. Um, Related to the question about the abolishment of police forces, how greatly, if at all, would that, would that impact what happens in the justice system? And what would we need to do within that system to address and correct that disparity? That's a big question. <laughs> it has more. I mean, overall, I'm breaking you know, this into two. Well, I, I mean, obviously, I, I, you know, as I said, the, the 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 context in which I've heard abolition used most frequently lately has been with respect to the prison system and overturning patterns of mass incarceration, and I, I think that that's something that we really really have to uh, have to have to address is uh, is is the enormous over incarceration that takes place, and that has implications for the system of criminal justice writ large. Uh, and also for police practices, uh, you know, we we would not have to have as much policing by any means if there was a host of minor offenses that we didn't put black people in jail for. So, uh, so, so, you know, I, I guess my my response here is that in thinking about reforming the criminal justice system, and maybe reform is too weak a word, but we really do have to have to address the. Uh, the, the pattern of mass incarceration. And when you think about mass incarceration, what do you think about, you know, there's that moment when the geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about um, California prisons, at least, as warehouses of surplus labor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an argument that the nature of the economy has to change so that it's not simply about disciplining black labor. It's now about where to hold all of the extra labor. Does that argument make sense? And when you yeah. think about kind of like the nature of work, the nature of economy, the nature of capitalism in this early 21st century moment? So I'm a pretty old head now. And I think in 1982 or so, I wrote an article called The Managerial Class and Surplus Population. And I was trying to explore the issue of which segments of a nation's population, which groups are identified as disposable. And uh, disposability could mean that you actually eliminate these folks, and, and that would be genocide. But disposability also might mean that you might hold them in reserve in some way in anticipation of some other potential use for them, or you hold them in reserve in some way because you're generating incomes for folks who you do not view as disposable, who are managing them. And I think that that's in large measure what has occurred with the prison system. So it's a warehousing of black folks whose lives are devalued and consequently viewed as more disposable but it also generates incomes for the folks who are suppliers to the prison system, for folks who work as the, uh, as the guards in the pr prison system, for folks who are the wardens in the prison system, uh, and so forth. So, uh, so, the, so the folks are being warehoused, literally, as, 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 as Ruthie Gilmore would say. 
And, um, but I think it's, it's part and parcel of this wider phenomenon of, uh, of societies identifying or labeling particular groups as being, uh, as being surplus or superfluous. So the second part of this question asked, have there been efforts to rewrite the 13th Amendment to exclude the accept as punishment of crime loophole in the abolition of slavery and involuntary servitude? Is this achievable? What effect would it have on the current state of policing of the Black community? So I'm not sure that the word of the law, the written word of the law, will have much of an effect on policing practices. Um, you know, police, policing practices are violating the written law on a continuous basis. I mean, an act of murder is a violation of the law. So, so I'm, I'm not sure it would make that much difference there. Uh, but it would make it possible, I think, for uh, litigation to proceed against prison systems where the patterns of imprisonment do have the characteristics of enslavement. Uh, and so I think there would be a value in eliminating the exception clause in the 13th Amendment. I have heard some people talk about it, but I'm not aware of who is actually engaged in the process of trying to do it. And it seems significant that both the military leadership and many police chiefs are now supporting the right to peaceful protest. Is this really a difference from earlier waves of protest? If so, do you think it will make a significant difference in what these protests can achieve? Um, I'm not sure it's significantly different, but I think uh, we have in, in the past, particularly in the late 1960s, uh, we have had the National Guard called out. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure there's much of a difference there. Um, I think that for the most part, at least in the late 1960s, the National Guard showed more restraint than the local police forces did. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully the, uh, the, the military officers and the military operations that are managed at a more national level will also show similar restraint in the present moment. Uh, I know that there has been, as I said, pushback on the part of some of the uh, now retired military leaders, but also some military leaders who are in place uh, about this notion that uh, the US armed forces should be used to suppress or quell uh, the protesters, which is uh, you know, something that's desired by the president. So, um, so, you know, my, my sense is that maybe there's not anything that's substantially different about the present moment, except there's a much greater pressure to use the full array of the armed forces for the purposes of, in quotes, quelling the uprisings than there was in the late 1960s where the segment of the armed forces that was mobilized was exclusively the National Guard. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we've got a temporary glitch here with uh, Adrian being frozen. Uh, so I'll try and answer some of the questions that appear in the chat. Uh, the next question says, given all the systemic issues and social policy work needed, what advice would you provide to young people interested in securing justice today? Well, as, as a member of, uh, of a generation that has largely failed to procure justice, uh, I'm not sure that we can give you any significant advice. Uh, I think you need to forge your own path, uh, but I, I, I do have some suggestions or ideas about the types of policies that, that might be pursued. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, I, I, I would like to rely upon the creativity of young people. Uh, because I, I can't imagine that you can do a worse job than, than my generation has done. Uh, says, can you please talk about what's at stake in the 2020 election? What does my vote mean in 2020 in terms of putting the right people in office to enact this change? Uh, 
how were the 2020 elections at the local, state, and federal levels particularly significant to addressing comorbidity and wealth disparities? Well, uh, from my perspective, there is no possibility of bringing about the types of transformative social policies, bringing them into law under the current Congress. And uh, that's particularly a consequence of the fact that you have a Senate that is led by Mitch McConnell. So uh, one of the vital things that could occur in the 2020 election is a transformation of the United States Senate uh, in conjunction with uh, maintaining uh, a House of Representatives that, uh, that would be receptive to the types of social, social programs and social policies that I've been talking about. So uh, that's what I think would be a critical dimension of the, the next election. But also I think, unfortunately, in many previous elections, we have grossly underestimated the, uh, the importance of state and local elections. And this has resulted in, uh, in, in having uh, state legislatures that also are very resistant to the types of social changes that I think are essential. So, uh, so the 2020 election is, 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 is an important one, it's a critical one. Uh, I, I think that it is one that we have to view as critical, not just at the presidential level, but especially at the congressional and at the state and local levels. Uh, I think we've hit the end of our time. I would like to thank Adrian for inviting me to be her uh, interlocutor today. Uh, I, I hope that maybe at a future date we can do this again. Uh, I'd like to thank the Keenan Institute of Ethics for organizing this series of conversations. And I would like to thank you as an audience for joining us today. And you will receive an email with a link to the video of today's confirmation and information about upcoming conversations. So thank you all uh, and have a good day.